affected local businesses weather the pandemic, ensure jobs were protected and the local communities insulated. We should all be proud of the money from government that enables council to support those in need. And there was many, not just supported out Councillor Williamson, but let me just highlight a small few. There was financial support there to help us support fuel and energy for those in the most vulnerable needs, school food pantries, mental health fund for schools, a winter uniform grant allowance, help for those in need of white goods, and over a million pounds for household support and welfare needs. Mr Mayor, the 265 million I just mentioned that was given to Wirral didn't actually include the furlough scheme, with more than hundreds of millions of pounds that went to supporting our residents for months, keeping them in jobs, providing financial security for their families so they could pay their mortgage or rent, heat their homes and put food on the table and got us through numerous waves of the pandemic. Not only this, Mr Mayor, but it was announced last November that the Conservative government is providing an extra £28 million for Arab Park Hospital to upgrade Wirral's only accident and emergency department. This will completely transform and improve the emergency and urgent care for our residents. This is the biggest investment the hospital has seen since it's built in 40 years. But Mr Mayor, there is more. The Conservative government has put its money where its mouth is when it comes to levelling up in Wirral. And let me just give you a couple of examples. In the last couple of years, we've seen 108 million come to Wirral to help us level up. This includes 25 million for the future high street fund, nearly 25 million on a town deal, and 20 million to level up Woodside, just naming a few. The government's commitment <coughs> to levelling up Councillor Williamson was actually demonstrated by the recent visit that you and I attended by the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, to Birkenhead. Where he's actually thanked and welcomed by a couple of the local shoppers there. So it wasn't quite a fallacy as you've made out before, and it was charity for you to do so. The funding this government has given will help reshape our, reshape our high streets, bring large investment to our area, support the people in their local environment, bring more affordable and green homes to our brownfield area, but more importantly, provide jobs and skills for local residents, improving theirs and their children's quality of life. Mr Mayor, I also understand Wirral is in a bid for £100 million of Home to England money and I'm positive that this will be progressing and the relationship with Homes England in their new role and the white paper will see significant investments in Wirral. Fingers crossed the hard work of our officers are successful in that bid and bringing more money to Wirral. But regardless of that, this is the biggest cash investment Wirral has seen for generations, if not ever. The council budget before us tonight is far from perfect, I'll admit that. However, what it does do is removes that structural deficit that's eye-watering that's accumulated over the last decade. It sets a legal and balanced budget. It protects our most vulnerable in social care and looks after children. It gives basic maintenance to our borough in needs in terms of cleanliness and works towards a clean, green and pleasant environment. It protects the school crossing patrols, keeps our parks open, keeps our coastal public toilets and sets money aside for libraries, providing a fund for those community groups who wish to take them over. The budget builds upon Wirral's great regeneration ambitions. It provides stability to use the government's levelling up money, which will rapidly accelerate the growth and regeneration of our fantastic borough by planting the seeds for growth, skills and attracting new jobs. Mr Mayor, there's no doubt in my mind that councillors from whatever party wish to see Wirral successful and prosper. That's a reason why we all seek election, to make our area a better place and improve the lives of our residents and local community. This budget be set to finances and puts the foundations there to do that. It's not the start, sorry, it's not the, it's not the start, it's not the end, but it's the start of creating the jobs, the skills, the environment that with the right decisions, Wirral prosper and grow and I would urge every councillor to support it. Thank you Mr Mayor. Councillor Gilchrist, uh, you now have up to 15 minutes to speak on your budget amendment. Thank you. Thank you Mr Mayor. 
I didn't particularly want to comment on what Councillor Anderson has said, but I can't miss, can't afford, can't miss doing so, because as a council we should not have to beg, we should not have to grovel, we should not have to crawl to get money that residents need to support us through this crisis as of right. Councils had to make a case, have had to make a case for redevelopment schemes. The government took time to come to terms with the crisis. It got to terms with the crisis as the year went on. We are not supplicants, we are proud people. And we don't need a lecture on how good the government is, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Mayor, I'll go to the, our budget now. I think we have been criticised by government inspectors. We can't avoid that because it's in a report. If we hadn't received that extra care grant this year from the government to cope with the elderly crisis that we have, we would have been in even greater trouble. Whilst we have lost some grants, we benefit from the business rate system at the moment. We also benefit from some one-offs, but as a council, we can't live in the hope of one-off grants from the government that are uncertain. What local councils need is a fair funding system, and that's what we want. This year's budget is a survival plan. It does come after weeks, months of soul-searching and agonising by members of all parties. It comes, I think I lost count, over 20-odd meetings of the Finance Subcommittee, Policy Resources members, trying to find a way for this survival plan. And whilst Councillor Anderson can point at some of the past mistakes and some of the errors, um, I can appreciate those because they're well researched, but conveniently uh, there are things that were overlooked and I have to disagree with some Labour colleagues here because we think in the end the Gulf Resort cost us a substantial sum in settlement and it ran on for too long we might have pulled the plug earlier. But it's the government, Mr Mayor, that has pulled the biggest plug. Because in the SIPFA report, what it said was on page 12, members have been reluctant to accept proposals that might have an adverse impact on the provision of services to the community and officers have not routinely delivered the savings agreed. And I've often pointed out that that criticism is actually of us as members trying to do a decent job for our residents, trying to keep services going and trying to meet local needs. It happens that this year's council tax rise, and I prefer to look at my house rather than Band D, but we're adding into my bill £9 for police, £1.50 for the fire and rescue authority. The mayoral precept for Merseyside says the same. But overall, the, we are being asked in my house to find an extra £54 or so. That is to the benefit of our residents, but it is that level because of the financial challenges we face. And that's, there are aspects of the budget that I want to comment on. I mentioned that we had as members spent years, probably almost 50 years since the world was formed, and there was a shadow authority from 1973. We came into being in 1974. I have to have got a copy of the last copy of Bevington's official guide from 1973, which speaks proudly of Brackenwood Public Park, for example, and lots of local facilities. And the other day, a gentleman from Hoylake wrote to me, I think he wrote to all members, about the things that Hoylake had lost. Every community has had things that have disappeared over the years because we've had to manage as best we could. But in managing as best we could, we stored up some problems for the future. We didn't invest in some of our leisure facilities that now, according to reports, would need a 14 million spent on them to bring them up to date and to help them survive. This budget does put money aside into a fund. Page section 3.21 of the budget talks about a fund as a prudent measure in recognition of future unknowns, including the outcome of consultation. It calls it a contingency reserve of three million pounds that has been built in. And we've had some representations in recent weeks. That contingency reserve was built in, according to the budget papers, 
to address any potential delays in delivering savings from the 1st of April. The trouble is that some of those potential savings actually store up damage for the future. So I'm going to touch on the issue of the golf at Bennington, Brackenwood, and the issue of the tennis centre. We've had a number of emails from Bevington and Wirral Wide residents about Brackenwood. On the 1st of April, our officers are expected to take an operational decision on what to do about the future. In recent weeks, the paperwork, the main emails from the Brackenwood people have clearly said that pulling the plug on the 1st of April would not work. In the summer months, residents are, thanks to our wonderful weather, inclined to play more golf than in winter. It is a time when revenue can be generated, but pulling the plug on the 1st of April does not strike me as being a good solution. When people want to get out and about, want healthy exercise, we're actually taking a site away from them. Now, some of the reasoning for that is that the players may go elsewhere. Some of the reasoning for that is to try and protect the green belt and a site which in the existing UDP is protected and certainly I think is protected in the forthcoming plans. But taking the service away from there and taking maintenance away would leave that course to deteriorate at the very time when we need to be involving other people in looking at its future, bringing in groups and having constructive talks with them. Now, I do want to thank the leader for talking to me regularly about this and what's the best way forward. We, we don't actually agree on the best way forward. I think the best way forward is not to go for that saving that's identified, but to give those interested in that course the chance to take it as an up and running facility. Similar considerations arrive with the Tennis Centre, also the subject of our amendment, as to whether it should be funded for a longer period. There are discussions with the Lawn Tennis Association. There are accounts of what the Lawn Tennis, Lawn Tennis Association have said. But the key is that they are offering, or seem to be offering, to come in, offer, give us advice and help turn the centre around. That doesn't rule out doing other things within the centre or altering it. But I think, again, the budget is too tight on that point, too restrictive, and that we need to be more adventurous in seeing what can be done because of the leisure facilities that we have. Other councils have managed it, like Nails and Report, Cheshire West Council. I only have to look over the board and see some of the things they've achieved when they set up a trust to run their facilities. So other people need the opportunity to see what they can do in Wirral. Now, last year, when I uh, got into a little bit of hot water, and may have helped, uh, perhaps not helped, didn't intentionally help, uh, the Ada Burns Review. She looked at the discussions we had about car parking charges and then wrote her report about how council, councillors spent a long time discussing issues and didn't necessarily agree and then went back on, few, bent back on previous decisions. There are times when we have made decisions that are not likely to work out, don't seem to be able to work out, and got ourselves painted into a corner. And the chief corner is, of course, that department of levelling up housing communities. And I understand all the sensitivities about this because we haven't had the letter back from the government saying that we can borrow, have that loan that's going to cost us money. That loan came with conditions, conditions I always feared would have an impact on our society and the fabric of society. And what the letter from the government on the 2nd of November said, any faltering in this area would be of considerable concern and could lead to a reconsideration as to whether a different approach might be appropriate. Well, that's a threat that is hanging over us. And I appreciate the sensitivity of getting a budget through and trying to head off the intervention, the very intervention that the leader has spoken about. We have, over the years, and I recall very much, look, looked at the library service. We have before us a very detailed report from officers that went to the committee in January. It set up a process of consultation. Some of that consultation has been overtaken by what policy and resources suggested, but the outcome is still a review. And whenever we review anything, what I'm looking for is a degree of fairness 
and understanding of each of the local cases. And I hope all the local cases that are put will be considered fairly and not constrained by a very strict adherence to the issue of the three million pound. The three million pound was intended to give us some breathing space, not to be blown, not to be just used, but there to help us salvage key services for our residents. So there is a Liberal Democrat amendment, Mr Mayor, it covers those issues. I commend it to Council, but I suspect it may not reach agreement. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Right, um, Councillor Kelly, a seconder. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right until the end of the debate? Oh. Sorry, can you use your mic? Thank you, yeah. uh, thank you Mr. Mayor. I'll reserve my right to the end. Thank you. Um, so now we have um, the Green Group budget amendment. Councillor Cleary, you, know, you now have up to 15 minutes to speak to your budget recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think like, um, like Councillor Gilchrist, I, I started off my preparations for uh, this evening by revisiting the, the external assurance reviews uh, that were published three or four months ago. Uh, and one of the, the SIPFA recommendations on page 24 reads, there is, there is little evidence that members and officers are working effectively together to develop a clear financial plan. So the first thing I'd like to do is just thank all the officers who have worked, I think, very, very effectively over the last three or four months and have worked very, very hard and diligently. Uh, and the fruits of their labours are here in, in this budget. I don't like all the things that are, are in the budget, but I do commend officers for the hard work that they have done. It has been and is a difficult process. Uh, and in thanking them, I'm thinking particularly uh, of the reference on page 78 to the staffing implications of this budget, where it says it is estimated that the overall number of posts to be reduced is approximately 136 full-time equivalent. So this budget will affect many, many of the people who work for this council and have given many, many years of service to the public. The second thing in the uh, SIPFA report I wanted to refer to was the issue of reserves. It says that we need to review the level of earmarked reserves to rebuild general reserves to an appropriate level. And pleasingly, and also conveniently, that review has so far yielded two and a half million pounds to raise the general reserve level from 3% to 4% as advised by SIPFA. And Mayor, it would be disappointing if further interrogation of our earmark reserves did not release more funds to bear down on the capitalisation sum which we have been forced or are being forced uh, to borrow for this year. And this matters for many reasons. And one of them is the ongoing sale of council-owned assets. We were told on the publication of the SIPFA report there would be no fire sale of public assets. But I ask, is that really true? I would draw members' attention to one relatively small but I think significant uh, proposed sale of public assets, the Quarry Bank Industrial Estate in Birkenhead. This is a fully occupied industrial estate that generates net revenue to the council of around £50,000 a year. The only justification provided by officers for that sale is that it will support the Wirral plan and its delivery to the generation of a capital receipt. Mr Mayor, that's a very low bar to, to overcome, to justify the sale of an important public asset. And there's no reference to the, the positives the positives in terms of the revenue we get every year, the positive, positives in terms of control of the asset going forward, 
and the positives in terms of security of tenure for important local employers. So I find that somewhat worrying. Hopefully when that proposal comes to the Policy and Resources Committee, it will be interrogated quite thoroughly. And I think we need to watch very carefully for future proposed sales of our assets if they are going to be justified on relatively flimsy ground and if we're going to throw away important sources of revenue going forward. That brings me on to what the SIPFA report had to say about savings. The SIPFA report said we need to set challenging targets to identify additional savings. Well, originally, at the beginning of the process, the overall savings proposals were set at £27 million. So we certainly succeeded in setting challenging targets. We were told the financial settlement from government was unlikely to significantly impact on this number. In the event, the settlement improved our position by over £12 million. And at this stage, we were told there would be a 15% contingency applied. Now, while some contingency might be appropriate, no evidence base has ever been supplied as to why it should be as high as 15%. And in contrast, the savings plans in this budget have a much more robust evidence base. Should we not at least expect the same when we are told to apply a 15% contingency? And of course, there's no upside contingency. There's no upside despite the fact that this year is the 10th year in a row that our actual income will exceed budgeted income. So hence the welcome, but I would say unsurprising decline in our capitalization sum for the second year in a row to just over £6 million. So Mayor, the high level numbers on savings, on capitalization and on reserves have all moved in the right direction since this process began. Officers have already demonstrated a very high degree of caution in framing this budget. And many of the proposals in the budget are genuine savings that will not impact on frontline services and can be welcomed. Some are particularly welcome, uh, for example, the extra capacity for looked after children in Wirral that we can look forward to. The Green Fleet review of council vehicles that will save money and cut our carbon emissions the end to council-funded fireworks displays, and the long overdue reduction in energy use in council buildings, as tabled by the Green Group of Policy and Resources. But Mayor, many savings are cuts, pure and simple. They will inevitably impact on our staff, as I've already mentioned, they will hit services, and they will further increase the despairing levels of inequality in our borough. So, Given the positive trend in reserves and the reduction in the required capitalization, and also the robust interrogation of savings proposals that we have gone through, it is our view that the contingency as applied is really a very blunt tool to ensure the SIPFA recommendations are adhered to at such a pace that is inconsistent with due regard to the likely social and environmental impacts. It does not allow appropriate time and space for alternative proposals to emerge and to be duly considered and supported. As Councillor Gilchrist said, we are storing up problems for the future. We need time to look at alternatives and to give people the appropriate space. And we're not doing that in this budget. So in that context, we bring forward our amendments to help mitigate against some of those impacts. On the libraries, a process of consultation has been established at committee last month. It is based on extensive and commendable research. I don't agree with everything that officers have, have tabled for the public consultation, but I voted for the consultation because I regarded it as a fair way to proceed and that 